Brothers and sisters, my friends, we celebrate this Mass looking to Jesus to be our strength in the Eucharist. And the Eucharist really is where he fulfilled, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever comes to me will never thirst. Let us go to him then. We have lots of hungers and thirsts. We hunger especially for love. Love is something we want to animate our life because then everything is fascinating. Everything is lighter than it normally would be. Jesus fed the 5,000 last weekend in our gospel reading. This week, he speaks of this daily providence. My Father gives you true bread from heaven. We hear in the first reading about the manna, which is a miracle, right? It appeared in the morning and disappeared in the evening. Everyone collected and each had enough for their needs. It had a sweet, honey-like quality to it. And it never appeared after they entered the promised land. You and I, our life is consisting of thoughts, words, and deeds. Our works, basically. We want them to be animated by the love of Jesus. That's, that is the goal. And it seems so far-fetched, but it's not. It's within our reach, it's within our grasp to think the thoughts of Christ, to say the words that Jesus would have us say, and then to do the things he wants us to do. This can really fill our lives. That way, when we're hungry for love to fill our lives, our life then will be animated by what the Eucharist gives us, the very heart of Jesus in the new manna. And it will form our minds and hearts to him. And then things are much lighter. No matter what comes at us, it will be kind of an adventure of life. I want to give an example of someone who allowed this to penetrate their life. J.R.R. Tolkien. The world knows the author J.R.R. Tolkien as for his works of literature, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and these are both are definitely epic novels that inspired epic movies. But you should know, however, that these epic stories and the rich and deep worlds that he created in them came from his deep Catholic faith that he practiced. His mother, Edith, was a convert to Catholicism. She was widowed at a very young age. And she had been dependent upon the support of her Baptist family. But they disowned her when she converted to Catholicism. And they left her destitute and poor. She shortly thereafter died, leaving two young sons. And she entrusted them before she died to the care of a parish priest. Gone are those days, no? <laughs> but she did. Tolkien's early life had two main factors of influence, his mother's faith and then the formation that he received, he and his brother, from this priest who taught them sacramental life of the church, the spiritual life of the church, and intellectual life. He even said that the Lord of the Rings that he wrote, his masterpiece, is fundamentally a religious and Catholic work. He actually became one of the translators of the book of Job. He urged his children then to go to Mass. Tolkien had his own family, and he urged his children to go to Mass, not just on Sundays and holy days of obligation, but even every day. This is what he said to his son Christopher. He said, the only cure for a sagging or fainting faith is communion. Frequency is of the highest effect. Seven times a week is more nourishing than seven times at intervals. The Eucharist was the strength of Tolkien's faith and the life of his works, of his deeds. And you see pictures of him, and he's a joyful man. Tolkien was no, you know, like sagging uh, British author, you know. He really was filled with the blood and body of Jesus that moved his mind and heart to do things that it normally couldn't do. In fact, his kind of literature is the highest kind of literature. For you and me have our own particular gifts in our family lives and in our friendships and relationships, have the power to make a great impact upon the world, especially a world in great need. The world is a dark place right now, and it's really good news for you and me, actually, 
Because it's really hard to be awesome and saintly without a huge need. So we must be fed on this beautiful bread from heaven where Jesus comes down so simply, so calmly, under ordinary appearances as to not frighten us by his majesty and then to feed our lives. And we can receive him so that he can become the life of our soul, the real movement of our life, that we encounter somebody and it's like, we can see Jesus in them, either suffering or in a good state. And then we go close to them. Our love of Christ will spill out into all of our relationships and make them stronger, even if the other person does not know Jesus. So concretely, what can we do to foster this? We can go to daily mass, yes, if we have that opportunity. Even just go one daily mass in the middle of the week. That might be a nice thing to connect the week by celebrating Mass, not just on Sunday, but then coming on a Wednesday morning, and then, of course, on Sunday, and it's this bridge of life connected by our faith. As your car passes a Catholic church, make the sign of the cross, knowing that Jesus loves you in the tabernacle from that church and radiates a power in the town that, in fact, makes the town less bad and, in fact, helps it by his presence, calming those around it. And when you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, this is another thing just to thank Jesus very simply, very authentically from your heart in the pew after you receive him. And then also we could take some time in adoration, either in the church without exposition or those times and periods of adoration at our local parishes. The Eucharist is the new manna. The Father gave you not just bread. He gives you now the new manna. And it's not just something to eat. It must form us from the inside. And we can let that happen, for it is communion with Jesus that our hearts really hunger for.